All right, so let's get started. Hi, guys. This is Smudboy. I'm going to be interviewing a friend of mine here. His name is Davis mm -hmm. M.J. Arini. And a little bit of background info on this guy. This is straight from his blog. He has been trained as a historian at McMaster University and as an infantry soldier in the Canadian Forces. Mm -hmm. He is an author, a strategist, a neo-reactionary monarchist, and an entrepreneur. He's a writer of the book, As I Walk These Broken Roads, which is a post-apocalyptic style genre book. He is an amateur film creator, I believe, of Lust in the Time of Heartache. And the reason why we have him on today is he's going to tell us about his project with Jordan Owen 42 of YouTube called The Sarkeesian Effect. Thank you very much for joining us, Serini. Absolute pleasure to be here, Stefan. Okay. Stefan, you Stephen. told me it's not Stefan. <laughs> 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 right off the bat, let's pull my foot out of my mouth. Let's restart the interview. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's all right. Uh, this is very, very similar to the uh, brother or sister interview that Monday and Matt has done with Jordan and I felt that we should probably get you online as well because you're a very misunder you're a very very misunderstood fellow online who I remember you back in uh, 2007 when I was looking at what the hoopla was about uh, proroguing the Canadian government and you were one of the few people who actually made a nice interesting and entertaining commentary about that uh, it must have been what seven years ago that's going back. Like that's back in the days of the Tucker Max message board. <laughs> like before it was even the rudiest media message board. You know, that's that's way back in the day. Well, that's that's when I subscribed, and you always sort of been there, and you've been slowly growing, and you've just been this this whole persona as you became Arini or Davis online. So, yeah, I've been watching you grow, and I know you've been uh, changing and, and learning as you go. Oh, thank you. It's. Um, well, you say I have complex views. I think, uh, well, let, 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 let's, let's lay it on the table. Reality is complex. And, um, and I, guess, I guess my number one pet peeve is people that want to simplify reality down to, you know, conservative versus liberal. Like, I, I'll tell you, one of the things that drove me nuts as a young man was people that said, yeah, I think that's a Winston Churchill quote, but if you're not a liberal as a youth, you have no heart. If you're not a conservative as an old man, you have no wisdom. And, and, and that just struck me as absolutely absurd. You know, it is bloody self-evident that, um, like, like, you know, if two people are arguing, they can both be wrong, but they can't both be right. So it's, I, I do have complex views, because it's a complex bloody world. <laughs> Well, I totally agree with you there. It's always, uh, I try to simplify my arguments online. I'm, I'm somewhat controversial in the, the gaming critique world. I, sen I tend to focus on storytelling and games and, and all the wonders of uh, getting it right and getting it wrong when you, when you know the writer is, is uh, painting themselves into a corner and how, how skilled they are in getting out of that or in some cases not. So simplification is great for clarity. But the reality of some topics and themes, they just you cannot just simplify it to one sentence or one paragraph. It has to be sort of left up to the the audience at times. So well, you know, as uh, as less less wrong likes to say, the map is not the territory. You're you're right. You need to simplify concepts to get them out there, but don't mistake the map for the territory. Your sim your simplified understanding of the world is not the world, you know, a poll is not the actual opinion of the American people. Okay, all right, so let's actually get into uh, this whole uh, project you guys are doing, and it's called the Sarkeesian Effect, of course, based off Anita Sarkeesian. Uh, I have to ask, you've made some videos about her, but why are you actually going ahead and doing a Patreon-style funding project well I think the reason that we can oh, but like the reason we're doing a patreon is because this is not a series of YouTube videos you know uh, this is not like uh, I mean here like it's here's the joke uh, that Anita Sarkeesian raised hundred and sixty thousand dollars to do a bunch of YouTube videos and all of a sudden she's become an industry expert despite the fact that she says she thinks games are gross um, she's actually consulting on, I believe it is Mirror's Edge 2. 
She is a consultant for that, even though she said violent video games are gross. Killing is gross. She has no interest in those games whatsoever, and she's going to be telling the dev team how to make their game. Um, whereas what we're doing is we're asking for far less money, and it's, it's going to be a proper documentary that we're filming, not a series of YouTube videos. You know, we could do that at home. The production values might not be quite as fancy. You know, like I, I do, I could make my videos fancier than I do, but it would take another hour or two in the editing room to do so. Mm -hmm. And um, and the point of this is to get a, a documentary because as uh, Marshall McLuhan said, the medium is the message. Uh, YouTube videos are great for people that are willing to think. You know, like, you, me, uh, people listening to this podcast, they are, they are intellectually curious people. Um, I'm sure that most of your audience is relatively aware of what's going on with Anita Sarkeesian. Uh, they do not need a documentary to tell them that uh, she is full of, of garbage, that she is not being a... She is not making genuine critiques. She's making critiques for the sake of critiques because it makes her popular. They don't need to hear that. But there are people that do need to hear that. And by making a documentary, all of a sudden this isn't a bunch of people on YouTube or a bunch of comments on blogs. This is a real documentary. And I think that's what has the, uh, the social justice warriors and the average uh, video game journalist with quotes around the word journalist. Yes, yes. This is what has them running scared. This is, this is why there's been so much buzz over this despite the fact it hasn't been even been a week since we announced it. When I uh, first heard of Anita, that was about two years ago, and I saw one of the, the, after her campaign, I saw one of the, I think the first one, and I watched it for about two minutes, and, and after that I just said, this is ridiculous. I couldn't, why would I bother spending my brain power on even bothering to critique or understand this lady? Because it, it was completely biased. Uh, it, some of the things didn't even register me on a, on a quick, you know, test just like okay, let's look up this game. Wait, well, that's totally not what she's talking about. It was it was not even worth my time, and a lot of my my audience members were like, hey, why don't you look at this woman? And I'm like, I don't really feel the need. And just recently, I mean, I everyone knows the, what's been happening recently with Zoe Quinn and uh, various other journalist organizations that are trying to support her, and she gets you know over two thousand a month from Patreon. And I'm thinking, holy geez, this is getting a little weird. And I'm glad that we finally have at least the opportunity to come to you guys and say, hey, you know what you're doing. You've been talking about this for a while. It's about time someone starts doing it. So one of the, one of the arguments against uh, just the actual uh, idea of doing a Patreon issue was that, well, you know, eventually you're going to have to either not do it because you're not going to hit your limit or you're going to do, if you're really serious, you'll take the money you've got and try to make something but you can't. Uh, some of them would say, well, why don't you just use a Kickstarter or an Indiegogo, uh, get an actual, you know, the, the 15 grand and then start doing stretch goals. Like, why, what was, the, what was the idea behind Patreon as opposed to doing other methods? I'll tell you, the number one thing is accountability. Um, on the one hand, like, let's say instead of doing a Patreon, we're just doing, uh, like, like, we forget the Kickstarter, the Patreon, we're just asking for PayPal donations from people. And we had a little ticker that kept track of them. Um, at that point, let's say we get to $5,000, right? $5,000 is enough for me to fly down to Atlanta or to meet Jordan or for him to fly up to Calgary to meet me. It's enough money for us to start getting things done right. and then stall before we're over the hill. So, and then, of course, we would be tempted to do that. You know, like if we got $10,000... You know, we could, do, we could do some interesting stuff for $10,000, but I don't know if we'd be able to make it over the hill and, uh, and start coasting. You know, like put the car in fifth gear. Like once, the, the huge challenge to starting anything is in the first, the first steps. You know, you have to start with first gear, second gear, get the bloody thing moving. And then once it's moving, you pop it in fifth gear, it's a lot easier to move forward. So you know, what, once we get that first, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just curious because you guys are going to meet up and do this project. I thought maybe because you're in Canada, you could actually talk to some Canadian companies and developers and journalists and whatnot 
and give a certain perspective in Canada, whereas Jordan can go ahead and, and tour the states and get the interviews. Because he's been talking about contacting, he's been getting contacts from a lot of people, and he really wants to you know, talk to these people. And I'm thinking, well, I don't know how exactly you guys have your game plan going, but what is the, what is the idea? It sounds like you're going to come together and do things together like that. Uh, yes, like this is going to require um, the two of us, and we really want to get a, another guy. Well, we are going to need eventually another cameraman, but uh, right off right off the bat, at the the fifteen fifteen grand, we can start the ball rolling, even if it's just the two of us. Um, we will need to get a cameraman eventually, but then we we've got the ball rolling, and so we will be interviewing people. You know, not just from the games industry. Uh, I'll tell you one guy that I really want to get on this documentary, and I'm optimistic that he will be on it. I'd like to get a little bit more. Uh, I'd like to get a little bit more momentum before I contact him. But it's Ezra Levant. Uh, if you aren't familiar with the name, he's a Canadian journalist. Oh, I'm very. I've, yep, I I've, definitely know the guy. Yep. I love the guy. Uh, essentially, and I'm probably going to get a fact or two wrong. I, my apologies if I, I do, but I believe when the the Mohammed cartoons, the the Danish cartoons, yes, yep. came out, uh, he was one of the only two publications in North America that actually published the cartoons that were causing this massive controversy. Yeah. And as a consequence, uh, he, what the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal tried to stomp on him because a Saudi imam who was living in Cal in in Edmonton at the time complained that they were racist right. when it was journal it was honest journalism is what he was doing and rather than kowtow to the the bureaucrats and the thought police he stood up to them and he sent them running it cost him a lot of money it cost him it was a it was a major impact on his lifestyle but he stood up to them and he fought against them and so i want to get him on this documentary because right now we're talking about video games right you know and it's critical as crucial as video games are, they are a part of our culture. It's how we tell stories nowadays. At the same time, most people would say it's just video games. Uh, ironically enough, Sarkeesian supporters sometimes say it's just video games. Well, if it's just video games, why does she need $160,000? <laughs> um, but, but honestly, it is, just, it is just art. Except it's not just art. It's not just social justice warriors complaining about video games. This is part of a larger method, a, a style of attack where you set yourself up as a victim and then try and censor anybody that's just being honest. And every single one of us is a potential target for these. You know, a gay, straight, left, right. Like the Human Rights Tribunal, they shut down a, uh, a bed and breakfast that was, what was it? it? It was owned by a gay couple, and it was either hypoallergenic or something else. It was hypoallergenic, and a blind person said that I need to bring my seeing eye dog in. Okay. But it was a, it was a small bed and breakfast, rural Nova Scotia or something, and the, the Human Rights Tribunal says, no, you're not allowed to have this hypoallergenic thing for people that will die if they come into contact with a dog, because that is prejudiced against that one blind person that came there for the first time in 10 years. Right. So this, this really is a bigger thing. And it's about standing up for the right to have conversations, to have arguments, to be honest. And it's standing up against the corruption and the financial motivations that are behind these people. One of the uh, things that I remember reading about uh, social justice warriors is social justice is not justice. It is looking at a disparity between blacks and whites, men and women, young and old, rich and poor, and trying to somehow say, this is not fair, we gotta change it. Whereas justice says, we don't care how tall you are, how short you are, we care about the law. We care about what's on the books. And there's this disconnect of understanding, just in general, that people who think they're doing the right thing aren't actually thinking of what is actually legal and what is actually allowed already by men and women. They already have these freedoms. We have already gone through the disparity issue. We've gone through the, uh, the income issue. Like, this has all been dealt with already, but they just, just don't know modern history or they just don't know 
basic statistics from the sixty's and seventy's where this was the issue and it's like no it's 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 been resolved we've fought the the suffrage came by we've gotten racial equality we, we have it it's there so what's what's the major problem and this is the, this is what's trying to i can't grasp why people are are you know lifting up pitchforks and saying this is bad i i, I can't grasp what uh what this movement uh on the i guess you can call it the left or the extreme right or whatever else that's not uh, moderate is is actually trying to accomplish because i look at anita or sarkeesian and people like them and i don't really see them impacting the industry directly i maybe maybe what she does with you know mirror's edge or ea when she goes on tour that might uh get some professional or public opinion changed but i can't see them really doing anything it isn't it doesn't seem like they're being effective it's just annoying everyone with this rhetoric that has no basis you know uh yeah, all it's doing is taking away from the game industry. And now here's an example that it's not, this is, this is not because of social justice warriors or because of any other group, not really. It's, um, what I'm thinking of is in video games, the killable children in Fallout 1 and 2 that had to be removed for Fallout 3 and Fallout New Vegas. Oh yes, I remember that. And if you, now in the original Fallouts, uh, if you killed two children, and it didn't matter if you did it on purpose or not, okay? If it was, yeah. if you were in a shootout with the bad guys and one of your stray bullets struck a kid, you were now a child killer for the rest of the game and there were bounty hunters coming after you constantly. <laughs> People despised you. You know, like this is the, you know, presumably most kids are born mutated in the Fallout world and they die at birth and you just killed one of the surviving children. You are a piece of scum. And, uh, like that added dimension to the game. With interactive media, having the ability to choose the wrong thing is absolutely critical. You know, if you hamstring the player into always doing the right thing, then there's there's no interactive media. You're watching a movie. It's With video games, it's supposed to be if you do the wrong thing, there are consequences for your actions in the game world. And now the reason they took the killable children out is because, you know, Jack Thompson, parents groups, what people would have freaked out. And so the developers said, you know what? Killable children did add a really good element to the game, but it's not a core it's not it's not necessary to the Fallout world. It's good for it, but it's not necessary. We're gonna pull that out just to avoid the controversy. Uh, but it but the game was harmed because of the sort of people in this case, Jack Thompson's and parents' groups that will jump up there and act just like these social justice warriors are acting. Although, at least with the parents' groups, you can say it's a misguided, like it's it's honestly misguided. Whereas yes. the social justice warriors, there there is strong evidence of financial motives underlying. Uh, I see. I, I'm glad you mentioned uh, Jack Thompson. That's one of the issues I brought up with uh, arguing with people online recently. The, the same, uh, pretty much the same attitude that he has towards violence is just about the same issue that Sarkeesian has towards uh, disparity between the sexes. On, it's, it's really the same thing. There's really no evidence that this is causing sexism or misogyny in players uh, the same way violence is not being caused by players by playing Grand Theft Auto. It just doesn't, there's no stats, there's no science, there's no evidence. And when you see sexism or uh, a woman about to be raped or mutilated in a game there's a natural reaction from anyone whether they're male or female to want to help this character even if they're they're no name npc whatever and i don't understand how that's a bad thing i think showing off violence in games in a violent game that has these themes like uh you know the wild west uh in red dead redemption where it's it's kind of lawless and you have to go out and and do things that you may not want to do and might have to deal with or completely avoid. Uh, it seems like that's kind of a really good thing to put in a game like that, but apparently because it follows a pattern in storytelling which involves women being potentially murdered, uh, this is somehow bad? I don't understand this. You know, I, I think the... I'll tell you, one of the problems with trying to argue with these people is that 
it, it's postmodernist, is what it is. Really? Wow, that's pretty uh, damaging. Wow. And and so every single sentence has about thirty things wrong with it. <laughs> so to like, I did a twenty-minute video about a single sentence in one of the the I, I, yeah one of the attack articles on us on um is is big badass magazine or something like that. I, I, it's an attack article because it completely yeah I saw that it was us. it was ridiculous yeah I remember that yeah. and um but. It, I think like if you're going to talk about what's wrong with Sarkeesian, it really boils down to tropes versus women. The the mantra of TV tropes, which is a summation of every trope that has ever existed in fiction. And, and let me just pause for a moment to explain what a trope is. Sure. A trope is a recurring theme or character or plot or plot device that happens in fiction. So Luke Skywalker meets the wise old man that teaches him how to be a Jedi. That's happened in, you know, a million and one works of fiction. That is a trope, the wise mentor. Or another trope would be the road trip story. Um, you, you mentioned my, my novel Broken Roads is a road trip. You know, it doesn't really have an overarching story. The story is these two men going on a road trip and learning about themselves and learning about the world. You know, that, that's a trope, the road trip story. And the mantra of TV tropes is to remember that tropes are not bad, but they can be used badly. If, if you're watching fiction and you're aware of the trope that you're seeing, it's probably not very good fiction. <laughs> it's, a, it's supposed to lull you into believing in the world, and you don't realize that you're watching trope because every story has tropes. Yes, and I... damsel in distress is a trope. Women, some men love rescuing women. Men love sacrificing for their civilization. Whether it's just our blood and sweat or if it's our very life, that is what we do to protect the women and children. I kind of I kind of find that ironic because the the white knights will wantonly you know fall back on their swords for whatever the the social justice issue is, and it just so happens to be being a knight in shining armor in games and it's like can you not see the irony of what you're actually arguing against well yeah she's complaining about the damsel in distress and then she repeatedly paints herself as a damsel in distress it's it's like staring into cthulhu's ma you know <laughs> it's, it's it's like a a, a oh what, what a ian malcolm love in jurassic park uh oh <laughs> Uh, a fractal. It's like a fractal. The more you stare at it, the deeper you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like Anita really... She's not really making a movement. She's just causing this weird confusion amongst people with her very uh, uh, colorful and, and you know high production value videos uh, influencing all these, these fellows to, uh, to listen and just nod their head. These, even... Actual game developers are, you know, you got to watch this video series. Oh, it's great. So I'm like, okay, well, uh, I'll leave that to, to critical analysis some other day. But, you know, that's, that's what they're doing. What do you guys actually hope to accomplish? And how are you going to release this thing? Because there's been a lot of talk about, well, is it going to be a, a one time video? Is it going to go to a theater? Is it going to be, um, you know, distributed online? How is it going to work? All righty. So uh, th two questions in there. I'm going to answer the second one first because it, it's easier to answer. The, the really short answer is I don't know yet. <laughs> okay. um, like this thing is, it's, it hasn't even been a week and it's picking up a lot of momentum. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a little prediction right now because I'm pretty sure not that many SJWs are going to be listening to this this far in. But um, right now... Right now, all these stupid social justice warriors are writing about us. And we're getting a lot of hate, a lot of flack. The smart ones haven't said anything. You know? Um, I, I presume Anita hasn't said anything because she's too busy getting attacked by that guy that was making death threats. Right. And I completely 100% believe that that is a genuine thing and not a false flag. Right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I predict... Because like I've already haven't seen the confirmation yet, but I have heard rumors that uh, 
a memo came out, not mentioning us, but in a number of game companies ordering nobody to talk about any of this. That it's too hot and you might lose your job. And so I think over the next week, we're actually going to see, we're going to see most of these people rein themselves in. Somebody's going to stomp down on it and say no more articles about this. And it will go completely silent. That's, actually, that's actually really interesting because I was posting on a blog post by some, I think it was the national something.com, and it was up to about 120 uh, comments within, I don't know, two hours. And I made a really big log, big, big post. I pretty much critiqued everything this guy said. It was very popular on uh, Twitter. A lot of people were linking to it. And within 10 minutes of that post, it said, uh, posts are disabled. And then with 10 minutes after that, posts have been, you know, you can't post anything. And this was just, just today. So it's getting a little awkward now, bef just trying to get a dissenting opinion and just trying to get the, the dialogue going, it's just not happening. Well, and that's, that's really a big part of the story as well. Uh, allegedly, 4chan has had all of its mods replaced with people that are sympathetic. <laughs> 4chan so, has mods? <laughs> yeah, uh, 4chan! 4chan used to, you know, it certainly wasn't a very nice place, but at least it was honest. Uh. And, uh, and we know that Reddit has been shut down for the whole thing. Um, now, on a strategic level, what's happening is that we actually launched our, our Patreon a couple of weeks early because of the events with Zoe Quinn. Um, and now what's happened is we've become a shelling point for all that frustration over Zoe Quinn. And the, the current goal of, and you know, maybe this is a little bit conspiracy theory, but uh, what I'm predicting is that we are going to see a lot of, like, just dead silence from the other side in short order. Um, they're hoping that because they're not talking to us, it will eliminate us, it will demoralize us, and this whole thing will go nowhere. But what's also going to be happening, even though it's going to be harder and harder for the majority of people to get their voices heard, um, at that point we will become a stronger node, because we will be some of the only people talking about this, which will help get the momentum to make this thing actually happen, to make it into a really good documentary. Uh, so I, back to the, the how it's going to be released, I don't quite know yet. Um, our goal is to get it into a theater release. You know, we are definitely doing a DVD of it, and we are definitely going to be doing an online download. You know, I haven't completely looked into these options yet because, I, honestly, I have enough other stuff that's higher priority. Mm -hmm. You know, but Netflix, probably. I don't see why not. And uh, now, and I guess that kind of answers the first part of the question too. What are we really trying to do? Because, as I said, uh, you can. For a single video by Anita Sarkeesian, you could go on for days on end <laughs> about everything that is incorrect about that. And, and you're still kind of where you started. So we're not looking to do a documentary just about uh, she is wrong in this case and she is wrong in this case. Um, you know what? Uh, Internet Aristocrat does absolutely hilarious videos oh. about how saying the social justice warriors are, and he makes them entertaining. So, I absolutely love that guy. Um, he's already done it. We don't need to do that. Uh, what we want to do is actually do the proper investigation. And this is what you can't do with the YouTube video. You know, actually go and talk to, talk to game developers who've had doors shut on them because they weren't politically correct. Right. Go get these people's stories like, we've all heard about Donglegate. How many of you have seen an interview with the, the family man that lost his job because of it? Right, yeah. How many of you have... Uh, actually, I'm going to rein myself in. Uh, we are privy to some very interesting information about the background of some of these people. And we want to get that out there. We want to... We're not going to talk about their arguments so much, because their arguments are obviously wrong with a, a cursory glance. 
we want to focus on the web of behavior behind the, the tropes versus women video. And, and Anita is just, uh, she's not the first person to use this method, but in recent memory, she is one of the most prominent. She, like us, she is a shelling point. Ergo, naming the documentary after her. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'll, you've been getting a lot of, uh, not flack, but a lot of jokes aimed at you. Uh, I kind of found your depiction in your pitch video kind of comical compared to your normal uh, persona. Are you ever going to change it, or are you actually going to keep that sort of funny, silly uh, spiel you guys two went back and forth in that video? Because it, it sort of it sort of makes people think, wait, are these guys serious? Like, well, yes, they are, but they're coming across as sort of nonchalantly, ah, we're going to do a video, you know, look out. Uh, how serious do you want to appear to people on your pitch? Is it just like, hey, guys, relax, we're going to take it slow? Or it's like, no, 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 no. we're really going to do this. Let's do it right now. Let's get the ball going. Like, what's, what's the attitude there? You know, that, that's an interesting question. It hadn't even occurred to me. Um, it, it might be worth our while to change our pitch video. Uh, because with the pitch video, we weren't thinking about anybody but our primary, you know, I like the people that follow us on YouTube, people that are familiar with us. And yeah. it was really just a video, or, or people that might not be familiar with us, but right. read because the blog. When you, when you go on Twitter, there's all these pictures of all the dissenters and I mean, as soon as you came up, oh, this guy's Kane, Man and Conquer, right there. Um, you know, they were making all these cracks, and I'm like, you know what? Basing this on appearances is the first step to people when they don't accept what's happening. Uh, I know you can you could really ham it up, but you don't need to. Uh, you can be just as, as cognizant and serious as you need to be. So I know you're very good at understanding strategy. I know from your past few videos you understand marketing very well. So I was like, you know what? You can actually just take the extra time. And there's a lot of people who would like to help you. I mean, I, I can do my own video editing and whatnot. But just to actually say, you know what? We'll just you know, cut the music, keep everything quiet, uh, give, a, give a list of things you want to accomplish, some goals. Like it, the, the, co the content was OK, uh, telling you what the, the project was about and the people you want to talk about. But I, I felt the tone was a little too, um, how to say, not not ser not as serious as I thought it would be. Well, you know, like I said, it was an announcement video, and trying to give people enough information that about what we're doing. That yes, this is a serious documentary, but at the same time, without boring them. And uh, and honestly, this was put together pretty quickly because uh, oh, yeah. we both have a lot of obligations. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> that we're juggling right now. Um, but no, that's a, that's a good point, and I think it might be in the next few days, a time to update that video into something a little bit more in-depth, a bit more of an explanation. Yeah, and you know what, I'm going to think about that. That's a bloody good idea. I've been so rushed lately, <laughs> I, haven't, I barely had the time to breathe. I was glad I actually got you online, because even I've, I've been busy. I have family over right now, and I'm like, Gosh, i got to do an interview. Shh, go away. So uh, I'm glad yeah, I got you. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, shh, be quiet. Okay. So uh, anyway, those are all my main questions for you. Another one of the reasons why I wanted you to get online is because because you are controversial and people can't, uh, they, don't, they don't take the time to read you or get to know, because again, you have a lot of stuff. You cover a lot of topics from politics to sexism to uh, you know, PUAs and all kinds of things that people just don't have enough knowledge of. But the two things that uh, I definitely think you should talk about. These are kind of gotcha questions, but I'm sure you're more than capable of handling them because I believe everyone must have the capacity to eat their own words. <laughs> and, and if there's anyone who could eat their own words, it's you. So the first issue that people come up with, aside from all the, oh, he looks like Cain, blah, 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 is that you're probably a sexist. Now, I know that's not the case. I've been listening to you for years. You're definitely controversial on, on the discussion between men and women and the roles and whatnot. Uh, but what they do is they link to a post of yours on the Stairs at the World site or your blog. And the title, I believe, is called No Equality Between Compliments. And that was by you this year in June of se uh, second. It's, the subtitle is Or Why Equality Between the Sexes mm -hmm. is Chimerical at Best. 
And there's a quote that they always, always use. This was happening on the weekend and even this you know, today. Uh, I'm going to read it to you. And I, I didn't see anything wrong with it because I understood the language. But let's just get your take on it. Here we go. It's this theoretically possible moral nature that I appeal to here. It is well past the time that women drop their conceit of holding legal equality with men and start embracing the power, which is their birthright, that of the divine feminine. Leave legal equality to us men. It's the only way that's fair. What does that mean? <laughs> oh, I do like stirring the hornet's nest. Um, well, right, right off the bat, I'm not even sure what this word sexist means. Because... Again, not to harp on the nonsense from Sarkeesian, but she keeps pointing out that these games are targeted at white heterosexual males. You know, e even though you know n what 97% of males are homosexual or heterosexual, you could just say men, and it would be assumed you're not talking about the three percent. Whatever. Um, but uh, here's the thing: she is she herself is making a sexist statement by saying that heterosexual men have particular preferences. You know, like that this is so blindingly obvious that you have to be really educated not to notice it. <laughs> that that there are differences between the sexes. Well, the and social justice warriors would totally disagree with you right there. Mm. Yeah, and I, I don't even know where to begin with those people. <laughs> but um yeah, the, the thing is that when we're talking about men and women is we are so incredibly radically different from one another that if you try and come up with a, a standard to measure both of them by, then it's going to be an unfair standard to one of the sexes. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. It is it's going to be abusive and exploitative of one of the sexes. And you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. It is this casual sex culture. It is bad for women. Um, women in general, in general, women in general will regret casual sex far more often than men will. You know, like they, how many men report date rape? You know, it, almost none. You know, it does happen. And certainly there is more of a shaming culture than a man that gets date raped or like forced into sex by a girlfriend he is less likely to report it than a woman would be because there's less sympathy. He's going to get made fun of. They're going to say, what are you, a fag? So yeah, men are probably less likely to report date rape. But at the same time, yeah, like, even, re dis even regard including that, men simply don't feel as much emotional involvement with sex. You know? And so a culture that promotes anonymous casual sex you know, uh, this this is going to be emotionally damaging for women more so than it will be for men. You know, like, for a woman to secure a husband nowadays, you know, if a woman wants an emotionally invested relationship, she wants to meet a guy that will care about her, it, she pretty much has to put out. You know, and she might go and put out for the wrong guy. A guy might tell her all the right things you know, I want to marry you, I, I love you, etc. Mm -hmm. Use her for sex, and then drop her. And that, applying that identical standard, pretending that men and women are exactly the same with our sex drives, with our emotional needs, in that case, it really, really hurts women. So when you say that uh, women should drop their conceit of holding legal equality with men, uh, <laughs> that's the concept of realizing that there is a difference and when they claim their birthright which is the divine feminine which I believe is a more religious term and that's even more complicated to understand to have them embrace this ideal femininity that they should then lead by example to the rest of the people well honestly maybe I should have said political equality and not legal equality okay uh, because I I do think that we should all be held to the same legal standard um, I think women are just as capable of being intellectually honest and intellectually rigorous as men. I think they're just e they're equally capable of being moral people 
And I think on a legal sense, we should all be held to the same level. And that saying that you, a woman's testimony is only two-thirds of a man, like they do in, uh, under Sharia law, I think that is absolutely abhorrent. Um, and so I probably should have said political. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's... I'll eat my own words. There um, we go. Thank you very much, Davis. All right, we got uh, but, <laughs> but One thing I want to add to that. When I talk about the divine, you know, it, I'm not talking... Well, I am, but I'm not. I, I'm not talking like some South California hippie. You know, it's... The divine is the fact that... Like, why... Like, explain this to me. Why should a bunch of monkeys that got out of the trees and, and shaved their bodies... Why are we able to build apartment buildings? Why is a species that's designed for tribes of 150 people able to build a civilized structure, uh, like with millions of people living in cities? Why is it that these two sexes who evolved with their own reproductive script to maximize the number of genes that, that appear in the next generation, why is it these two sexes with differing biological objectives Manage to fall in love with one another and create the harmony of a marriage. That's what I mean by divine. That there, there's, there's this spark of creativity in the human soul. There's this thing that's just absolutely amazing about us. And, and for women to try and measure themselves as men. You know, did you go to school? What is your income? Uh, so on and so forth. You know, like, the, these masculine attributes. For a, that, that completely denies a woman's ability. Like, a, a good woman, a noble woman, is going to inspire so much uh, protection and love from the men around her. You know, not just sexual love, but devotion and love. By her being a, a virtuous woman, men will protect her, men will make sure she's okay. And when a woman shows appreciation for the guys that behave like virtuous men, that encourages men to attempt the, these insane, impossible feats of building civilizations, inventing technologies, all of this stuff. It is a dance between the sexes, and they've turned it into a war. So you're not, you're not advocating that women should stay out of engineering or anything like that? You know what, if a woman wants to go into engineering, then she should go into engineering. You know, it's not my business to tell any one individual what they should be doing with their lives. But if, if we discover some sort of gap between the sexes, you know, that there's always, we should always ask what could this be an element of something, you know, is there a reason for this? For, uh, for instance, I'm reading a book right now asking the question, why is it that for 500 years Christianity has been primarily a religion for women that men are not attracted to? when we see many other religions that are equally participatory, like both sexes participate at the same rate in Judaism, in Islam, in Buddhism. Why is it that Christianity is different? You know, yes, it is valid to ask that question. Why are there fewer female engineers? But you also have to be prepared to get the answer because women just aren't as driven to be engineers. Or men are more driven. Etc. And you equate that with uh, natural ways of, of development in women's studies and biological reasons, uh, social reasons. There's a whole host of reasons why there is a disparity between men going into more of the sciences and women going into more of the social sciences, let's say. <coughs> Absolutely. And, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to devolve everything to, you know, a Freudian, it's all about sex. Uh, but a large part of it is sex, is, you know, a, a good man tries to provide resources for his woman. You know, as well as protecting her, he's going to provide resources. And it's really as simple that attractive men are the ones that create the most resources. Rich guys, in other words. Engineers. Whereas the most attractive women are the ones that are very nurturing, that are loving, that would make good mothers for our children. And although a good mother is going to be very educated, she is going to be as educated as she possibly can because she needs to raise smart babies, 
Um, her spending 15 years of her youth pursuing a PhD, you know, and then paying off the massive amount of debt she collected, you know, that is not the sort of thing that she is. She is not going to be as attractive as a woman that is has devoted herself to trying to create a, a home and attract the right men. Now this is the, the same issue you can give to men or women of various sexuality. Uh, the gender roles are pretty much the same. Can we apply that to, let's say, a male and male relationship or a female and female relationship? Because you're talking about uh, the role of the f woman as a certain type of person and behavior the same way as a role for a man would uh, uh, be behave. So can you apply that the same, or are they different? Well, here, I, I don't want to... Uh, let me just start off by saying I'm not an expert on this. Okay, I have not studied this extensively, and what I'm about to say could be completely freaking idiotic. Um, but from what I am aware, uh, homosexual relationships, whether it's gay or lesbian, there does tend to be a masculine partner and a feminine partner. You know that that there are these two uh, there are these two elements to to the dance of life. So what you're talking about is just a, just as applicable to bisexual, gay, and lesbians. I, I would think so. It's like the real challenge of a relationship is is forming a relationship with your opposite. And I would suspect that the most successful you know homosexual relationships are between uh, two, two people that are differenti differentiated into what side of the yin-yang they most closely subscribe to. Okay, that was a very detailed uh, and uh, somewhat uh, broad explanation of whether or not Arini is a sexist or not. <laughs> 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 and and the last part could be complete garbage. I'm not an expert. <laughs> go, go ask a guy that either studies or is a part of the gay community for a better answer on that. Excellent. Thank you very much, Irini. Okay, the, the, this is the last question, and this is also important. It's not as complicated, uh, but it probably needs a little bit more explanation. I don't know. Um, and this is that you are, in fact, a racist. Um, this was, I, you know, I've I don't think you are, but we'll find out. Uh, there was a posting you made on your YouTube channel uh, two weeks ago called Racism is a Personal Problem. They link to this. Um, they, you say in this video that you are a white nationalist uh, on paper uh, as opposed to a white supremacist or white anything else and that you're proud of being a person of color. Uh, you also uh, link to Sotomayor's video, who's a black uh, YouTuber and he has differing opinions on ethnicity and on color and race and gender and you agree with him on some things so what does what are you actually saying in your video what does it mean to be a white nationalist on paper well all right now the funny thing is i did that video because i was really sick of the white nationalists constantly trying to recruit me to their cause and so that video is actually telling the white nationalists to go fly a kite <laughs> um, because despite what they say on paper, I find them, and uh, again, I do not want to paint any group with one single brush, all right? Generalizations are generally true. Not a, I, I find that most of them are very hateful people. They're very venomous. They're very sneaky. They're the sort of people that will say kind words to your face and then stab you in the back when you don't know about it. So that, that was kind of my my get the, get off my channel I'm sick of you people clogging the comments with your ignorance um, <laughs> you know I've always said if you're getting called a racist by one side and a race traitor by the other you're you're pro if, if if you're getting flack it's because you're over the target <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's safe to say that uh, you just got fed up with all these racial issues and you put it in a very uh, powerful message of what you were talking about being a white nationalist and from what I got to me, it just sounded like you were very proud of being of a certain culture, of a certain uh, time in, in the world, uh, just happens to be a certain skin color. That was, about, that was what I got for me. Um, yeah, it's, um, on the one hand, like, they're, they're, like, where do you draw the line between races becomes a, 
like, is there a European race? Is there a British race? Is there a French race? You know, like, like go back far enough in history and you are going to find differing tribes every step along the way, you know? Um, and yet there are these, these large categories. There are these, these cultures and, and there are these, these tendencies. You know, you and I are Italians. We are noisy and we speak with our hands. And it is no wonder that the British hate Italian immigrants because, <laughs> because we're a little bit too noisy for them. And, um, and the further apart you get, the greater these differences are. And, and different cultures, where they, they are, a culture comes from a biological group and it's usually optimized for the people, for, for the biology of the people in that, that country. You know, different dog breeds are different. It doesn't mean one dog is bad and one is good. It just means they're different. And I think that's bloody precious. Um, as Queen Victoria, when she shut down the East India Company, she gave them a lecture saying, your task was to modernize India, not westernize it. And your, your, the ignorant way that you treated the local populace, this is why I'm disbanding your company, because you failed in your objective. You were trying to turn them into British people. They're Indians, and they have the right to be Indian. That, that was a bit of a paraphrase of what Queen Victoria said, but... Mm -hmm. uh, and just so the audience knows, both Davis and myself are Canadian. Uh, we may have imperialist roots, but we embrace in Canada a, a wide number of, of ethnicities and, and immigrants, as opposed to the States, which is sort of a, a melting pot of uh, nationalism, I guess. In Canada, it's more of a quilted rug, I guess, where we just sort of integrate, and we can even maintain uh, the original countries or immigrants' culture, and we get along just fine. Yeah, uh, like one thing I've criticized in the past is um, the way that... Uh, our forefathers tried to destroy the native culture by banning the native language, by sending them all to residential schools. Now, I, you know what? 1900, Indians are living on reservations. They're dying young. They are not receiving medical treatment, etc. To say that they need to learn English because that is the wider culture, yes, yes, that's a good point. But at the same time, their culture should not be trampled into the dust. And I don't think we handled that very well. Well, it was kind of interesting for Canada to be uh, still attached to the crown while fighting the Americans and while uh, being brothers in arms with the natives. And then after we sort of, Americans look at us like, holy crap, wh who are we fighting? These guys are, they're British, but they're not. They're trying to be independent, but they're fighting with the natives. And okay, well, and then after we won, we s then said, okay, well, here's, here's our natives. We give up their lands and we sort of just, you know, try to make peace with our American brothers. It was a very odd situation, but... Apparently that's Canadian for us. We have this very unique understanding of independence, but yeah. Well, and there's the, the kind of the ongoing issue with the, the native reserves in Canada is that there's a lot of alleged corruption at the chieftain level. Like there's a lot of money given to the reserves that never seems to help the natives. And I would argue that we're seeing the exact same thing as we are seeing with the Anita Sarkeesian and the social justice warriors, that there are people hurting but they're not the ones getting the attention or the money, that there's corruption behind it, uh, people that are just out for themselves. So they create a big stink about how incredibly evil and racist you know, white Canadians are, and then they get more money for it, and then that money doesn't go anywhere good. Now that's, that's a gross oversimplification, obviously, but that's, that's one thing that I'm, I want to have Barack Obama said he wanted an honest conversation about race. I don't think he was telling the truth. But I actually do want to have an honest conversation, uh, warts and all. <laughs> and of course I'm racist because I want that. <laughs> let's, let's not get into uh, American politics. We'll be on that <laughs> night. <laughs> oh boy, yeah, that's, that's a can of worms. <laughs> okay, well thank you very much for your time, Irene. I hope uh, uh, viewers or other people who disagree vehemently with Irene and generally uh, the other side of the conversation learned a bit if you actually sat and listened to this all as, as opposed to leaving a dirty comment within 20 seconds of realizing who you were listening to. Uh, we appreciate your time and we hope to open up a dialogue with you guys soon. 
So thank you again, Davis, and good night. Absolute pleasure. Thanks a lot. Take care.